Hey guys, Tex here. You know, I started doing these because, er, you know, everybody asked me to. And I've always been fascinated by the subject. I um, watched all the movies, a lot of documentaries, that type of thing, did some reading. But I've never really, really dug into it and did a whole lot of research on backgrounds and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I got to tell you, as I research these people, and that's a term I use using loosely, I'm finding that in most cases there's an abusive childhood involved. There are the exceptions to the rule, but usually it's by one or both parents, but most are products of an overbearing, abusive, and controlling mother. And if there is a father in the picture, they tend to be dismissive, submissive, or, or even both. That being said, I don't, I don't believe that these circumstances alone have created these monsters. I still hold to the theory that there is something about them that is just wired differently from birth and that they're triggered by events in life that their minds deal with differently. Or, you know, e could they even possibly be possessed? I, I can't think of any easier targets for possession than those that are teetering on the edge of an evil abyss from birth. I'm also drawn to the line of thinking that these types of people are very much like-minded in their basic concepts of humanity or lack thereof. Could this be due to being possessed by demons with a common goal? The plot thickens. I hope y'all enjoy. Gary Ridgway, aka the Green River Killer. As with most killers in his league, Ridgway had a tremendous amount of anger towards his mother. According to him, she was very controlling, overbearing, and was constantly belittling him. He was a bedwetter until the age of 13 or 14, and uh, up until age 8 or 9, his mother would parade him to the bathroom screaming at him, telling him how much of a baby he was and how he'd never amount to anything, and that he was worthless. Then she'd bathe him, paying special attention to be sure and clean his dirty parts, all the while belittling him. Being a poor student seems to be a main source of conflict in the household as well. Ridgway says his father wasn't around much because of work. And at one time, his parents considered placing him in a special needs school. He says he remembers them arguing about it, but he never says who was on what side of the argument. I'd lay money that his mother was the one that wanted to put him away, judging from the resentment he held for her and how seldom he mentions his father, and when he is mentioned, it's almost as if it's just a passing thought. He'd been fantasizing about hurting or killing his mother by strangling her or beating her to death or even stabbing her since he was about in the fourth grade, but he could never bring himself to act on it. Instead, he took out his anger on animals like birds and dogs and cats. He says he would shoot birds and dogs with a BB gun and that he suffocated a cat in an ice chest once. Around the same time, he began having sexual fantasies about his mother as well. He'd watch as she sunbathed and imagine her teaching him to have good sex, as he put it. His mother, according to Ridgway, would bathe him and again wash his genitals, and he'd shamefully become aroused. Depending on where you research, this is touted as the cause of his sexual fantasies. He also says that his feelings of her would swing from one extreme to the other. He would lust after her and then he'd just want to kill her. This also led to the mix of sexually violent fantasies that would be played out in years later. At 16, he lured a six-year-old boy into the wooded area by his house and stabbed him in the liver. And he ran off laughing and teasing. And he was never caught for it. When asked why, he did it. He said he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill someone. Luckily, it wasn't fatal. And the boy lived. When listening to him talk about these events, as well as the killings he committed years later, he seems very distant and 
almost has a lackadaisical approach to it all. He seems almost confused, like he knows he did these things, but he doesn't really relate to them. He disconnects so much so that he can't remember the names or faces of most of his victims, but was able to recall the locations of the bodies of most of them. Again, depending on where you get your information, it is reported that he led police to all of his victims or that he could only point out about half of them. Ridgway's first wife was his longtime girlfriend from high school. After they were married, he enlisted in the Navy, and while in the Philippines, he began to have unprotected sex with prostitutes, and he contracted gonorrhea twice. He laid the blame on the prostitutes, even though he was the one who chose to have unprotected sex. He developed a hatred for prostitutes that multiplied when he returned home and found out that his wife had had an affair. The fact that he viewed what she had done as an unforgivable act and what he had done as just a maybe just a passable offense at most. And then he places the blame on the prostitutes for the STDs he gives us a little glimpse of his narcissism. He takes no ownership of what he did and passes the blame to others. When watching his interviews, it appears to me that he is saying whatever the interview, what he thinks the interview wants to hear. He avoids detail when asked the simplest questions, and he repeats what he's asked, and appears to be of low in intellect. His IQ was measured at 82 once, but he was still able to avoid capture for almost 20 years, and has possibly killed close to 100 women. When trolling for his victims, he would regularly repaint his truck and use his son's picture and even his son to emotionally disarm and lure his victims into a false sense of security. This man is reported to have killed anywhere from 48 to over 100 women, most of which he says took place at his home. This man with an unassuming look and demeanor, with a low IQ, was able to do this while being married three times, having a son with his third wife and holding a productive job for almost two decades. I kept going back to the interviews, almost convincing myself that possibly he was possessed at one time and now he wasn't and was just a shell of who he was. But then I saw something. Ridgeway himself stated that his mother was likened to Jekyll and Hyde. Today we know this as being bipolar and I personally know several people that have been diagnosed with it. But there's something else at play here. Most bipolar individuals don't pause and act like they're getting the answers from somewhere else. In his interview, when they were trying to get him to confess to other killings and give locations of the bodies as part of his plea deal, they approached him with the theory that there were two Gary Ridgeways, the old Gary and the new Gary. And they thought they'd had a breakthrough when he would, lack of a better term, summon the old Gary. His facial expression, tone, and demeanor would change. He became angry and belligerent about the women he had killed and claimed that the new Gary was weak and a coward. He admitted that control was a driving force behind the killings, and when asked why he went back and had sex with the bodies, he said, well, you don't have to pay for it. They're already dead. When pressed further for information, he seemed to struggle with himself over which Gary was going to speak. He once proclaimed that his brain wasn't working the way they wanted it to. It wasn't often that Ridgway let us have a peek behind the curtain. But in another interview, when asked if he thought that there was anything missing from him, he replied, uh, yeah, that caring thing. As I delved deeper into Ridgway, the more I realized he was smarter than he let on. In my earlier writing, I questioned how does a man with such a low IQ get away with what he did for so long? I think the answer is multifaceted. He was lucky in a lot of ways. Technology hadn't been developed to properly analyze the evidence. And he was good at playing the Jekyll version of himself. He allowed people to believe that he was this simple, odd, but nice guy. He played authorities for months giving false information while they took him to different locations that he directed them to. Finally, when the DA confronted Ridgeway with an ultimatum, he gave up the real locations. It was either cooperate or get the death penalty. Four more of the missing were found, and he pled guilty to 48 counts of aggravated murder and was to live out his days in prison. 
When the families of the victims had their day in court to face him, the reactions widely varied. Some wanted him just dead. Others wanted him to suffer in prison. And some even forgave and prayed for him. This, above all else, brought Ridgeway to tears in the courtroom. Were the tears real? We'll never know. What we do know is that these monsters like him are still out there. In the summer of 1982, a mere 20 miles south of Seattle, the bodies of young women began to be found in and on the banks of the Green River. Detective Dave Reinhardt was assigned the case. Three women discovered the first day. This kicked off a string of dozens in the following months and years. A total of 48 women fell victim to this animal's bloodlust. With a total of 25 to 50 detectives on the case at any time, this animal would rain down terror for almost two decades. The number of officers dwindled to one at a point. This is when politics came into play and they slashed the funding for the task force, money being valued over life. The Green River Task Force was disbanded after one suspect they had in their sights was cleared, even though he failed a polygraph. But women continued to disappear while the suspect was under 24-hour surveillance. It's interesting to note that Ridgeway passed this same polygraph. But seven months passed and the killings all but forgotten. Reinhardt, being stumped but not undeterred, asked a friend who just happened to be a notable profiler named Bob Keppel to take a look at the case files. Three cases deemed unrelated during the first investigation trip red flags. One was a waitress laid out in ritualistic fashion. She would prove to give insight to the killer's mind. Her body was discovered by a family foraging for mushrooms. She was face up with a sack over her head. Her arms were crossed over her chest, cradling a bottle of wine. Over her hands was ground up sausage molded into a pyramid. Laid over her shoulder and throat were two trout. Oddly enough, this was the only victim found this way. I wonder, could this have been the only kill that their first suspect had committed? These discoveries seemed to open the floodgates. In the coming months of 1983, bodies were found all over King County, Washington. By the end of that year, 14 bodies were found. 23 more women were missing and presumably dead. The lion's share of the victims were prostitutes or runaways. And if there was any doubt whatsoever, now everyone knew that there was a vicious predator in the area and he had no intention of stopping. With the creation of a second task force, 14 more bodies were found in 1984. DNA at this time was in its infancy, to say the least. But it was the DNA recovered at this time that would lead to the conviction of America's most prolific serial killer. In the midst of the investigation, police received thousands of letters offering theories of who the killer was. One of these stood out. It was penned by no other than Ted Bundy, offering a profile of the river man, as he called him. The insight that Bundy could give was not only that of a like-minded individual, but the river man was in Bundy's old hunting ground. Members of the task force flew to Florida to take Bundy up on his offer. You can see this scenario play itself out on the big screen in Silence of the Lambs. Bundy told the authorities that if they wanted to catch the river man red-handed, they should stake out a fresh kill because he was returning to have sex with the corpses. This paused a moral issue. How could they? I mean, even if they found a fresh kill, how could they leave it and stake it out like a piece of bait? If that ever got out to the public, there would be hell to pay. This, unfortunately, was exactly what Ridgeway was doing. It would be many years and many victims later before they were able to trace DNA back to and apprehend Ridgeway. Just after they traced the DNA back, the other shoe fell for Ridgeway. They were able to match paint from his clothes, truck, 
and house to traces left on the victim's clothing that identically matched the paint he used at work. He had to have enjoyed a feeling of dominance and superiority. He not only kept the authorities at bay for almost 20 years, but he had been in custody three times in 83, 84, and 87, and he'd been released each time. I would imagine with his level of narcissism, he felt untouchable. But on November 30th, 2001, his reign of brutality ended. One thing the authorities noticed when the body started turning up is that most of them were in what Ridgeway called clusters. This is so he could readily go back and have sex with them. Then there were several that were alone. These were what he referred to as his special victims. He deemed them special because they fought him and they didn't die easy. Ridgeway was arrested at his home, and even with the mountains of evidence, he proclaimed his innocence. His family stood by him like oak trees. They were all convinced that this was a horrible mistake. But as more and more evidence were revealed, even his wife had to admit that this was indeed true. She had been married to a monster. She distanced herself, separated, and cut off all contact. November 5th, 2003, any veil of innocence was lifted as he pled guilty to ending the lives of 48 women and was given 48 consecutive life terms. Ridgeway, in his own words, the plan was to kill as many women who I thought were prostitutes as I possibly could. Sadly, he accomplished this, and his plan came to fruition. I ask y'all, please, Take a moment of silence or pause in prayer for all the women that were hunted and preyed upon by this callous, bloodthirsty, and evil monster as I read their names. Rest in peace and God bless. Wendy Lee Cofield, 16. Giselle Lovorn, 19. Deborah Lynn Bonner, 22. Marcia Faye Chapman, 31. Cynthia Jean Hines, 17. Opal Charmaine Mills, 16. Denise Bush, 23. Terry R. Milligan, 16. Mary Meehan, 19. Deborah Lorraine Estes, 15. Shonda Lee Summers, 17. Shirley Sherhill, 18. Colleen Brockman, 15. Alma Ann Smith, 18. Dolores Laverne Williams, 17. Gail Lynn Matthews, 23. Marie Malvar, 18. Andrea Childers, 19. Sandra K. Gabbard, 17. Kimmy Kai Pitzer, 16. Sherry Lee Wims, 18. Carol Ann Christensen, 21. Martina Arthurly, 18. Yvonne Shelley Antosh, 19. Carrie Ann Royce, 15. Constance Neon, 20. Kelly Marine Ware, 22. Tina Marie Thompson, 22. April Buttram, 17. Debbie May Abernathy, 26. Tracy Winston, 19. Maureen Feeney, 19. Mary Sue Bello, 25. Kim Lee Nelson, 21. Jane Doe, number one. Possibly 15. Patricia Barksack, 19. Jane Doe, number two. Age undetermined. 
Pammy Annette Event, 16. Denise Plager, 22. Cindy A. Smith, 17. Lisa Yates, 19. Mary West, 16. Jane Doe, number 3, 20 to 25 years old. Roberta J. Hayes, 21. Jane Doe, number 4, 14 to 17 years old. Patricia Yellow Robe, 38. Linda Rule, 16. Marta Reeves, 36. These were originally listed of the Green Red Killer, the following ones, but Gary never admitted to killing them. Amina Agshef, 36. Tammy Charlene Lyles, 16. Jane Doe, number 5, age undetermined. And here's some more possible victims that they suspected that he did kill but never admitted to. Case Lee, 16. Kelly McGinnis, 18. Patricia Osborne, 19. May you all rest in peace and God bless. Thank you all for uh, listening. Um, these get kind of emotional for me. Um, and uh, especially when it's when it's kids involved. And most of those that I just read were mere children. Um, knowledge is power. So the more we know about these people and possibly what causes them, maybe the more we learn, maybe one day we'll figure out a way to spot them earlier before 48 innocent women lose their lives. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll have episode three up, and uh, fairly soon. I'm trying to get one, <laughs> trying to get one of these done every couple of weeks. Y'all stick around and go tell a friend, and uh, we got some exciting stuff coming up. Thank you again. We'll catch y'all on the flip side. Text out.